And um, as Fabian said, my lab in London studies uh, sleep. Um, the main question that we are trying to answer, and it's a big question, so it's a quite an ambitious task, is to try to understand why we sleep. I don't know if you ever paid attention to this problem yourself. Many people haven't. We usually give sleep for granted, but it's actually not something that we can afford to give for granted. And uh, the, the, the main riddle that we still have to answer is that we don't know why we sleep. We don't know why we spend basically one third of our life in a condition of uh, total, almost total loss of consciousness, which is, as you might imagine, also dangerous if you're living uh, as an animal in the savannah or whatever. Uh, evolutionary doesn't make much sense. Uh, so one, um, you know, the main uh, question that we still, the field still has to answer is uh, w what is the biological underpinning behind this evolutionary conservation of sleep? Why humans and all animals uh, that have been tested so far need to sleep? Um, we chose to address this question using Drosophila, and I don't have to explain to you why, because uh, uh, we simply believe that it's the best model organism to, to address this, this, this question. And what I'm going to talk about today is actually mainly about the technical development that we've uh, been working on to, to study sleep in flies, and also some of the surprising findings that we have had uh, using these new techniques. And then tomorrow's lecture for the course, uh, I'm going to talk more about the genetics that we uncover um, um, using this model organism, these techniques. Uh, most of what I show today and tomorrow isn't published, um, but you know, mature enough for me to stand here and tell you about it without being um, ashamed. Right, so um, I'll start with a very quick introduction to uh, why we think flies sleep in the first place. Um, and we think flies sleep in the first place because, uh, mm, you know, boringly enough, their, what we call their sleep satisfies the five textbook definition of what we think sleep is. And this is um, basically a list of those definitions. We start with a period, a period of quiescence <coughs> associated with a species-specific posture. So flies are uh, um, described to sleep in, in this posture by leaning back on their, on their back legs. Um, and that's the first aspect. Um, this correlates with an increase in arousal threshold. Increase in arousal threshold means that as you know very well, it's very difficult to catch a fly because they, you know, they fly away as soon as you approach them. But when they are asleep, like when we are asleep, uh, then their arousal threshold changes and you need a, a much bigger stimulus to, for them to wake up and fly away. Um, this um, state of uh, partial loss of consciousness is reversible and is quickly reversible to wakefulness. This is basically what distinguishes sleep from coma. And very importantly, is homeostatically regulated. Homeostatically regulated means that um, if you sleep deprived of flies, they'll be more tired the day after. On the other end, if you give them the chance to have a nap in the afternoon, they might have a hard time falling asleep in the evening, exactly like what, what it happens to us. So this uh, concept of homeostatic regulation of sleep is one of the hallmarks of, of sleep. You cannot really talk about sleep without having this feature. And finally, there is a strong interaction with the circadian clock which is both behavioral and molecular. Uh, flies sleep during the night, pretty much like us. Uh, as you will see, they actually sleep uh, amounts that are not too different from what humans sleep um, in a okay, circadian and regulated fashion. You also get some bonuses, like conserved signaling pathways, conserved neurotransmitters, conserved effects of drugs on top of that. So if you give coffee to flies, they stay awake. If you give them hypnostimulant that humans normally take to fall asleep, flies will fall asleep. So that tells you that the conservation is not just behavioral, but it's molecular, genetic, or, uh, genetics, and, and so on. All right, so how do we study sleep in flies? The um, most commonly used system um, is depicted here. It's a system con that conceptually was actually uh, put forward by Simon Benzer, the great uh, neurobiologist in the 60s, when he, when he first published his first, basically, uh, paper on linking uh, behavior to genes. Right? Simon Benzer is the person we have to thank for teaching us, for showing us that actually behavior is a genetic feature and you can find genes controlling behavior. And uh, he published uh, basically the first circadian paper describing the first circadian mutant using a system that was conceptually identical to what many labs use now. 
Uh, this is now commercially available. Back in the days, we actually used a spectrophotometer. If I figure that if you could put a poop in a, in a cubette of a spectrophotometer, when the fly would emerge, it would interrupt the beam recording the, the wavelength, uh, the desired wavelength, and this would result in a tick uh, in the machine. And so this was the first time, really, that uh, behavior analysis was automated in this way. So what we do now is we put flies in small glass tubes. These are about seven centimeters long. There's food on one end. There's cotton on the other. There's flies like cotton to get a bit cozy. We put one animal in the tube, and then we put the tubes in a machine where an infrared beam will cross the midline of the tube like this. It's infrared, so the flies cannot see the beam. Neither can humans. But it works a little bit like the lift doors. As soon as the fly crosses the, the midline, the, the infrared beam will be interrupted, and the computer will record the activity. So that means that you know when the fly is walking up and down the tube. And, and, and the assumption here is that if the flies are walking up and down the tubes, that means that they cannot be possibly asleep. They must be awake. However, as you probably already have found, this system has a weakness. And the weakness is, is that, that if the fly is actually not crossing the beam, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are asleep. They could be um, just simply walking on this side of the chamber, or they could be eating or engaging with food, thinking, dancing, anything, but you won't record activity, and so you will overestimate sleep. So we found this is a, was an important issue for us. So this tool has been instrumental, absolutely instrumental and critical to develop the circadian field, which, as you well know, has won actually the Nobel Prize this year. So it's, it's, it's a fantastic tool. But it's not probably the best tool to study sleep because you won't have a, a correct definition of when the flies actually are asleep, not just when they are walking up and down. And so we, we work to, uh, to develop a new system <coughs> that would improve upon this. And um, we use actually, um, being big fun in the lab of open source technology, open source philosophy, we use uh, components, both software and hardware, that are all open source and off the shelf. And the two main players are <coughs> these two. This is a microcomputer, it's called a Raspberry Pi. You might, some of you might be familiar with this. Um, Raspberry Pi is a, is a computer the size of a credit card, uh, and it's very inexpensive. It's about cost about 20 euro to buy, and it's a proper computer. You can connect it to a keyboard, a mouse, the internet, a monitor, and run all your computer activities on it. Uh, maybe not the super fancy video games, but definitely email, Facebook, anything. It's a, it's a really good computer, but it's again very inexpensive. And the other player is, um, let's say, the, the counterpart. Um, um, the Italian counterpart in this case, because the Raspberry Pi is, uh, was developed in Cambridge, the Arduino was developed in, uh, in Torino, which is where I'm from, and that is uh, a uh, open source microprocessor. Um, again, this, you can buy this for very cheap. Um, one of those is about one dollar, and, and they are programmable microprocessors. People use them for the more uh, fancy things. If you go on YouTube and look for Arduino projects, you will find people doing all the amazing, amazing electronics. So this stuff has really changed the way. Um, we can do um, um, custom electronics, not just uh, in the lab, but throughout. Um, and I, I, you know, I invite you to familiarize with this. It's really powerful tools. So we put these, these uh, things together, and we created something that we call etoscope. So what is an etoscope? An etoscope is, as the name suggests, is a machine that can um, detect behavior and analyze behavior. It looks like this. Um, it's composed of two uh, parts, really. Uh, an upper case, which is where the Raspberry Pi sits, the computer we were talking about, um, and the lower part where we put flies in, where the flies live. The flies are still housed in the same tubes that I described to you before, so it's just, we still use the same kind of uh, uh, behavioral environment. But instead of recording just the beam crossing activity now, we can record the entire activity of the animals. Because the computer is connected to a camera, the camera is looking down, and now we know what the flies are doing at any given time. We can uh, uh, watch them as they walk, as they feed, uh, as they lay eggs, as they interact. So we can uh, focus on their behavior with a much higher resolution, um, both temporal and spatial resolution. Um, we, this, uh, this stuff is actually published. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, we, we, you know, we're really keen in uh, people using this, uh, not just uh, laboratories, so also in the context of scientific communication, for instance, in schools. Um, and that builds on work that um, we've been doing in the past. Um, 
So we know that, uh, for instance, schools are receptive of this kind of tools and students, high school students, for instance, uh, do engage with this project. So for this reason, we actually provide instructions to build Ethoscope using um, 3D printing, which is what we use in the lab, but also using Lego, uh, which is you know, something that anyone, virtually anyone can have access to, and also paper even. So you can actually print out instructions, fold the paper, and build a, what we call a paper scope. Um, if you um, are into Legos, then we provide actually full instructions uh, along with the paper. Unfortunately, we did have to remove the Lego logo for copyright reasons, um, but we managed to sneak in the Lego scientist figure in there. <laughs> and so you can build a Lego scope and, and, and do your own experiment with your scope. And one of these will cost um, around uh, 40 euro. Um, a peculiarity of the machine is that, as the name suggests, again, uh, is not just simply looking at flies moving up and down a tube. Um, as long as they are in a contained environment, you can analyze whatever they're doing. And so, for instance, we have, um, these are examples of uh, other arenas uh, that we're using in the lab uh, for detecting behavior. Uh, this one is the one I mentioned before, where the flies go up and down. We have equivalents where flies can live in longer tubes. Um, we have arenas that we use for decision making, so if you're looking at some behavior that might be a bit more uh, challenging, uh, or you know, for instance, neurodegeneration linked uh, learning, um, we have stuff like this. Um, other um, arenas are um, bidimensional, so you can see more, uh, say, exploratory behavior in those animals. You can see animals interacting with each other, and I'll show you some data about it uh, tomorrow. Um, so, for instance, in terms of courtship, social interaction in general. So it's, it's very versatile. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, done in a way that um, it's, it's easy to use, because there's no point in having something easy to build if it's not easy to use. So it's quite plug and play. Uh, all you need to do is plug it to a USB port, it will power up, and then we communicate wirelessly to the network, collect the data in real time, and send the data off to a computer that uses collected data so that you can uh, then analyze the data from home uh, the day after or uh, when the experiment is done. And it's all controlled through a web interface. So, you know, pulling a plug for this because I'm keen in people using it. So if you think that uh, there is a behavior that you're analyzing, that it's not necessarily a leap, but anything that's related to this, you might want to give this a try and see whether you can detect um, um, better behavior with, with this system. Now, a, a, a very important feature of this machine is that we are not just simply looking at where the flights are. Okay? This is not just positional tracking. What we do actually is uh, some kind of uh, online, real-time behavioral fingerprinting. And we do, uh, we do this using um, uh, machine learning um, technology. So basically what we've done is we have selected about 2,000, 1,500, 2,000 short video, 10 seconds each. And then poor people in the lab sat down in front of the screen for a few days and label each video according to the behavior that they recognize. So they would label this video as walking, because the fly is uh, walking during these 10 seconds. This one is immobile. The fly doesn't really do anything within <coughs> those 10 seconds. Feeding um, by the food or grooming, which is something that you know, they do a lot. And so this is basically allow us to, uh, to recognize, uh, in general, three um, types of behavior, three basic types of behavior, walking, immobile, or what we call micro-movement. Uh, in real time, this is then scored, and then uh, in real time, you get information about what the flies are doing. Uh, it's not just where they are or whether they are walking, but actually whether they are, for instance, eating or grooming. And we, uh, the uh, recognition then using machine learning is quite accurate. We are quite happy with the results. We can detect immobility with a, um, um, basically a positive rate of about 99.7%, if I remember correctly, so it's virtually uh, spotless. Um, micro movements also have a very good recognition rate and, and uh, about slightly less, around 96, 95%, and, uh, and walking also works very well. So as you see from this image, we basically pick all the, almost all the flies except these two in the samples when they're walking and um, all the immobility and micro movement is a bit more tricky sometimes. <clears throat> so how do the data look like when you record with, with this technology? Um, well, the raw data you have um, is something um, like this. On the, on the lower panel, you see high resolution data. Uh, so this is over a time of about four hours. Um, and on the higher panel, you see low resolution. Uh, it's the same data, but visualized in a way where you actually uh, look at five or six days in a, in a row. Each row is an, a single animal. Um, we have 
five males and five females in this case. And um, you see here what we have is the black line is actually the line that tells you where the flies is at any given point. And then on the background, you have colors which um, uh, highlight the behavioral state of the animal. So in this case, it's uh, immobile, performing micro movements, or actually walking. And what you can already see, especially here if you focus on the females, is that um, the apparent immobility that you will see but just by looking at the position doesn't necessarily correlate with real immobility. So if you look at this individual fly, for instance, at the beginning of the night, she spends a lot of the time by the food with very little motion and only occasionally approaches the midline um, of, of, uh, of, the, of the vial. But yet, a lot of what she's doing here is feeding. Because if you look at the background, you see a lot of green. And so that means that she's really, by the food, eating. Um, and we do know that, uh, as you might have uh, heard before, that uh, female flies actually uh, you know, have a, a different uh, dietary requirement than male flies, so that their behavior, especially during the night, and especially the food-related behavior, is very different. So that's why, actually, for, for male flies, um, you, you do see long periods of inactivity, which then are real sleep. But for female flies, these are relatively rare, and often only uh, later on in the night. So what does it mean in terms of quantification? Um, this is where we quantify sleep. And what you see here is the, uh, what we call a hypnogram. So that's a graph characterizing sleep over the 24 hours, 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness, in both male and female flies. Um, the, 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 the continued line is sleep as detected with etoscopes. And the dashed line is the same animal uh, scored using the infrared beam technology. So what, if, what kind of uh, sleep would you detect? if instead of using actual movement, you were just looking at the infrared beam crossing. And you see that the, the two patterns are very different. So you clearly overestimate sleep with the uh, old technology. Um, and uh, this is uh, obvious in males, but even more so in females. Um, both uh, male and females um, have a longer bout of sleep during the night, which is where they consolidate most of the sleep. Males also have this, um, what we call siesta. It's basically a long period of inactivity of actual sleep during the day. Uh, because females are the ones running you know, the place, they cannot afford to, to be uh, having a siesta during the day, and so they are way more active during the day. So if you quantify the total sleep over 24 hours, you'll see that the difference is quite staggering. Uh, you will think, using infrared beam technology, the flies sleep about 80% of the time, when in fact they sleep only 50% of the time. Male flies, female flies, the difference is even more pronounced. You would think that they sleep almost 70% of the time, while in fact they sleep less than 25% of the time. So you actually overestimate the sleep by a factor of three if you don't use the proper technique. All right, so this is, uh, is, is, is quite uh, important. It basically lays the basis to everything we do in the lab, because as I said, you know, if you want to study something, make sure that you study using the best measure, possible measure to start with. Um, it also opened. Um, uh, a new path to new discoveries, which I'm going to show you now, and that they were very ines inspected. Um, and uh, we, we found those when we started applying this system to a large number of flies. So what we've done is we looked with it, a slip with etoscope in a, in a group of uh, flies spanning about 1,300 individuals. So we have 485 males, 881 females, virgin females. These are just wild-type Cantonese flies, okay? These are no mutants, just the lab, lab flies um, that we score in normal condition. And what you see is that um, <clears throat> there is a distribution of sleep amount. So on the left, you actually have um, uh, sleep uh, as a visualized over five days. The axis is gone here. And on the right uh, is a quantification of that sleep. So um, um, this will be 60%. And that would be 0%. Um, in males, um, right, so in males, uh, the, the, the sleep we quantified is not too dissimilar to what it was published before. Uh, you see that even the, the males that sleep little, they sleep a good 10, 20% of the time. In females, however, the picture is very different. That's why we concentrate a lot on females a bit more. And you do have females that sleep a lot. You have a large population of females that sleep less than 20, 30% of the time. And then you have a very long tail of females that are virtually sleepless. In fact, the most extreme girl here sleeps 240 seconds a day. Okay? That's 
few minutes, three minutes, four minutes a day. So why is this important? Because uh, as I told you in the beginning, sleep is an extremely conserved trait. There is no such an animal that's been shown so far to be sleepless. We haven't found a sleepless animal in all these uh, centuries of research. So in my opinion, this is as close as it gets to finding a sleepless animal. And it's somehow surprising that it's not a mutant, allegedly. This is just a natural variation in a well-type population of female flies. And so we started looking at them in greater detail. Um, we took videos of, of them, made sure that you know, this was just not an artifact, but it was <coughs> real behavior. And uh, we focused, uh, obviously, on also on, uh, on flies sleeping very little. Um, this is a better properly asked um, uh, picture of the female flies. What we found is that um, the main difference between um, what we can detect as sleep and what has been previously detected as sleep really lays in this ability to look at micro-movements and feeding in particular. And so if you look at the distribution of micro-movement uh, along the tube, okay, in male flies and female flies, um, you will see that um, both male and female flies like to be quiescent uh, about four or five millimeters away from where the food sits. Okay, so this is the, the food air interface line. And so they, they, they like to go asleep there. Obviously the male flies, they, they, they go and be quiescent much, much more than the female flies, as we've already seen. And the female flies instead spend a lot of time feeding, what we think is feeding. We don't have a you know, uh, smoking gun because we, we cannot really see them ingesting food. But they do these micro movements really in proximity of the food, so we think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fitting. Um, and then the walking obviously is equally distributed. So the, th the fact that the micro movements develop in an area which is different from the position where they like to go to sleep suggests that this is not just uh, you know like uh, sleep twitches. Uh, it's not the equivalent of you rolling into bed because they are not in bed when they do the micro movements. They're actually in the, in the, in the you know at the table having food. Um, and obviously you can um, analyze this um, um, a bit more quantitatively, and so what we did is uh, we can correlate the sleep that we, uh, the actual sleep that we measure using ethoscope with the sleep that you will be measuring using this uh, uh, infrared beam technology. Um, and you see obviously that um, it's not, you know, if, if, it were, if they were equal amount, you will see uh, all the dots developing along the, the, the line like this, because they are on the right, the reason is because uh, obviously they, they sleep less than what you think they will sleep. And uh, you cannot appreciate this uh, much in this figure, but you'll see that especially on this, uh, on this line here, a lot of the flies that you see here, um, which you would score as high sleeper using the infrared beam technology, but in fact are short sleepers, they have a big size because they do a lot of micro movements. They do actually up to 50% of feeding behavior in fact. Um, now, I told you before that, that, that I wanted to you know, that, uh, give a biological explanation to this. Um, insects in general, just not Drosophila really, have a different uh, feeding behavior, uh, which is uh, sexually dimorphic, uh, based in fact on the, their biological requirements. So basically the females have to lay eggs, have to lay, lay embryo. And this is very, biologically is a very demanding task, because they, as you know, they lay up to 200 embryos a day. So it means that they need a protein-rich diet. They need to prepare for that before actually getting uh, fertilized, and then also after <coughs> being fertilized. So they, that's the reason, most likely, why they cannot afford to have a siesta in the, in the afternoon, because they have to continuously feed in order to maintain their metabolism. So it is imp it, the feeding behavior is a very important uh, behavior for them. <clears throat> I'll get back to um, how this behavior is modulated in a few slides. Before we go there, I just wanted to stress one aspect. The aspect that uh, basically is that we moved with this analysis from a, a bi-dimensional readout, where the flies can, can be in a, either one of states, or either not walking or walking, to something way more precise, which is actually, in fact, three-dimensional. And uh, um, they can be walking, but they can also be quiescent or micro -moving. And they can obviously move from one state to the next. Um, according to the time of the day, for instance. So you can actually visualize this now um, as a, what we call the triangle in the lab, uh, but you know, with a fancier name uh, for the papers and the talks, which is a bit of a behavioral fingerprinting. And so what is the behavioral fingerprinting? A behavioral fingerprinting is a, is a, is a four-dimensional, at the end of the day, um, analysis that tells you what each fly is doing at, at one given point. <coughs> so you can imagine that this fly here 
has at this, uh, at this point in time, um, let's say in this one hour, it would show 60% of um, uh, quiescence, 20% of micro movements, and 20% of walking activity. Uh, so distributed like this uh, on average. Um, what do we what do we have right here? With this is basically the entire data set that I showed you before. We're talking about uh, that uh, um, 1,300 flies divided again in uh, females above and males uh, below. Each dot is an animal, and uh, what you have is uh, you can see how the behavior changes throughout time. Okay, along the 24 hours. And uh, we are, we, what we're showing here is the triangle, so it's the mixture of quiescence, walking, and, and micro-movement. And um, the same is shown on the right, um, along with the position on the tube. So you see that also the position um, on the tube changes throughout time. And so you can then correlate all these uh, measures and understand, uh, in fact, that when they're doing the micro-movements, they are mostly by the foot, um, and at least females do, um, and not necessarily mates. If we flatten all this data into one static picture, it would look like this. Um, again, so here we're looking at only the 24 hours, males um, and, and females. And, uh, and you see that basically uh, they have a different profile. You can already, by just by looking at these two images, you can tell which one is a male and which one is a female. So that's what we call behavioral fingerprinting. We think is interesting not just to detecting sleep, but it might also be interesting to detect, for instance, mutants, because you might imagine that even within the male population, you can find a subpopulation of mutants that not suddenly have a different profile. And uh, perhaps they sleep the same amount, but the be total behavior along the 24 hours is different. So, and I'll show you now how we use this um, exactly for this feature. So one question that we had was um, these females that sleep little, um, why do they do so? Is it because something in their brain tells them that they are maybe in a mated status or, you know, because all, all, the, all, the, all the things we're looking at, all the flies we, we've been looking at so far are basically virgin flies. And virgin flies are a lab artifact. Uh, it's basically, it's very difficult to find a virgin fly in the wild because uh, flies become sexually receptive after about eight to 12 hours. So in the wild, you might imagine that they, they will not stay in this state for very long. <clears throat> So nature has not prepared flies to, to this situation where they are unmated for a very long uh, period of time. And so my, you might argue, okay, you see them sleepless, but you see them sleepless because they find themselves in this situation which is not really natural. And so we looked at this and we look at how mating changes the sleep pattern. So what we've done is we took flies, we recorded the baseline sleep for a few days, and then on the third day, we introduced a male in the tube and left the male there for, if I remember correctly, uh, one hour, one and a half hour. So now the tube is not the best uh, you know, uh, romantic setting you can imagine. And so the, the mating that happens in the tube is not always 100% successful. Um, in fact, it's, it's conveniently 50% successful, which means that after one hour or so uh, that you left the, the female and the, and the male together, only about half of them uh, will mate. So what we do is then is we can remove the male, and we can now split the population by just looking at whether they lay uh, embryos or not between flies that have successfully mated and flies that have undergone the very same behavioral procedure, but they have not mated. And you see that sleep changes a lot between the two uh, populations. So the flies that are not successfully mated, they keep sleeping the same amount of time and with the same pattern as before the mating event. While the flies that have mated, this is the green line, they sleep way less. Okay, so suddenly, in this group of mated flies, sleep goes down even farther. So they sleep even less. So we thought, oh, okay, so then that might be an explanation to what, to what we see, actually. It's possible that those, uh, you know, those flies on the tails, the short sleeper, extreme short sleeping flies that we saw, maybe there's something in the brain that tells them that they, they mated. They think they mated, you know? Um, so then we, we this is a, 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 a convenient uh, hypothesis to then test our behavioral fingerprinting. So what we've done is we've done the behavioral fingerprinting on the non-mated flies. Okay, this will be the control. Uh, the mated flies, so it's basically the same flies but after mating event. And then compared to a, a group of equal size and equal sleep amount, which we call the non-mated low sleepers. So we went back to the original experiment 
took a uh, group that slept the same amount of, they had the same amount of sleep of the mated flies. So quantitatively, these flies, they sleep the same amount. But as you can see, the behavioral profiling tells you that they are actually very different. If you look at the behavioral profiling of the non-mated low sleepers, it is actually very similar to the non-mated control and very different from the mated flies. So even though these two groups sleep the same amount, it's these two groups that are closer to each other. So you can actually cluster this, mathematically cluster this, and it, it will look something like this. So you see that these two groups, the non-mated and the non-mated control, they are closer to each other than uh, the mating flies. So mating changes the behavior uh, in a way that is uh, just beyond the sleep amount. Um, and as you can imagine this, because what the main uh, um, you know, consequence of the mating is that the flies now they have to lay embryos, um, so they have to be more by the food trying to lay embryos. Obviously, they need even more proteins uh, because uh, at this point the embryo business became real, and so they need a richer diet. And so, it's not just the sleep amount that changes, but it's the entire behavior. All right. So, so far, what we found basically is that in one type population, you have flies which sleep very little, as I say, 240 seconds a day. Um, uh, so I was I was always in a kind of a, a unfortunate, well, not unfortunate, but um, difficult uh, position to stay, you know, stand here and say that they are completely sleepless because obviously I don't have evidence that they are completely sleepless. They might be sleeping a few seconds a day, but the question is, is that enough for them to survive? Because uh, if you ask sleep scientists, they will tell you that sleep is somehow of a uh, um, little uh, vital necessity. We have experiments done, in fact, in Italy uh, by a French scientist at the beginning of 1800. These were the first experiments of sleep deprivation. They were done in dogs, uh, and they were extremely cruel. And there's no stuff you, you, know, you would be able to do anymore by keeping small pups basically uh, always hang uh, from, uh, to a dish so that they could not lay down and sleep. And uh, this animal will die after a few days. But again, it was such a stressful situation that they were actually doing this in front of the mother because the mother still had to feed them. So it's something that is even horrible to describe. Uh, more recent experiment done in rats um, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in the 70s, also shown kind of similar results. Um, the animals will die after about 21 days of chronic sleep deprivation. So we have some evidence, although it's not much, that sleep deprivation eventually leads to lethality. Together with the fact that we're never able to find sleepless animals, this led to the hypothesis that sleep is a vital necessity, a bit like feeding. If you don't eat, you die. So that explains what is a biologically conserved phenomenon. So the question is, is this the same for our animals? Can we, you know, beside those freaks who sleep 240 seconds a day, what happens if we remove sleep to these flies for good? So this is how some people do sleep deprivation in flies. You put the flies in the arena, and then you put the arena on a, on a lap shaker. And then they experience this kind of earthquake uh, about once every minute, once every two minutes. And you imagine, you know, it's very disruptive. It works. Uh, but it can be associated to stress, it can be associated to physical damage. Often when you do this, you find the flies have lost their wings uh, or they ended up stuck to the, to the food because suddenly <coughs> they are pushed on, on the other way. And people have used different systems, but the principle is always the same. It's very violent um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the problem with sleep deprivation is that you actually want something that is not disruptive. What you want to do, ideally, is just to remove sleep but not induce extra stress. Okay, so if you were to do a sleep deprivation on a, on a, on a person uh, sleeping with you, uh, the best way would not just to rock their bed every one minute because they, they just, you get killed first, but uh, you know, they probably also have a lot of collateral effects. So what have we done? We, we conceptually uh, uh, took inspiration from this system, which is the one that I mentioned before was used for, for rats in the 60s. It's uh, known as the Discover Water System. Um, uh, it, it consists of two animals. One is the experimental animal, the other is the yolk control. Both animals are hooked through sensors to an EEG detector, so the, the computer will know if the animals are asleep or not. As soon as the experimental animal falls asleep, it will rotate <coughs> the platform. By rotating the platform, the experimental animal and the control are pushed against the wall. Okay, so if they are asleep, they, what happens is, and if, if they are asleep, they don't wake up, what happens is they will fall into water. And rats hate water, okay? They really don't like to be in water. And, and this happens, as you might imagine, several hundred times a day. So several hundred times a day, these rats is forced to walk, to wake up, and forced to walk against the direction of the, of the, of the disc. 
the experimental animal will undergo the same kind of stimulation, but it can sleep whenever the, sorry, the control animal, but the control animal can sleep whenever the experimental animal is awake, right? So it will get way less sleep restriction. So it's a control of the mechanics and you know, the times that they are stimulated, but not necessarily of the stress that they experience, because the control animal will basically never fall into water, for instance, or hardly uh, will. Uh, but the experimental animal will, over and over and over again. And so what happens with these rats is that after about 21 days on average, they die. We know they die, it's been reproduced. Uh, we don't know why they die. Uh, this uh, group, uh, Rex Schaffen, has worked on this paradigm basically all their life. Um, they published something like uh, 20 papers back to back almost on this experiment. Uh, in each of those 20 papers, they were doing autopsies as looking at there was something wrong with lungs, with heart, with brains, with, you name it. They never found anything. They found lots of signs of stress. So these animals, by the end of the experiment, they basically lose their fur. They, they, they have a huge metabolic change. They eat more, but they lose weight. Um, and they also have a change in body temperature. And this change in body temperature is interesting because it seems to be the point of no return. After the body temperature increases, the baseline body temperature increases, then you can take the animal, put them back in their cage, give them all the rest they want, they'll still die. So I suggest that it's something more systemic and metabolic than just a slip situation. Right, so we, we uh, conceptually use this system and we uh, then um, um, build machines, uh, we call mo modules, that go uh, under the etoscope. Now, I'm a bit scared now because the next one is a big again. Um, <clears throat> we plug this thing into the, the bottom of the etoscope and uh, we use um, particular these two systems here. Uh, we, we, we use them for many purposes. So this one, for instance, we can use it to give um, um, sensory stimuli, so for instance, odors to the animals. So when they do a certain triggers, we can send them a path of order. We use it to study consciousness, in fact. So what we're studying is we, we're studying uh, whether certain stimuli will wake the animal up or not. Because as you might know, if I call your name while you sleep, you wake up. But at the same time, you can fall asleep in front of Bruce Willis movie with explosions and all this kind of stuff and do not wake up. So the, your brain is still able to receive uh, stimuli and interpret stimuli while you're asleep. So that's what we're doing with this model. With these other two, we, we can do uh, optogenetics, but we can also do sleep deprivation. So they <clears throat> All right, so this is what happens. The animals are in these tubes, and uh, this is just a demo, so you'll see them rotating one by one. Uh, this is guy rotating, now this guy is rotating. Um, we can actually do uh, also optogenetics, so now you see a flash of light, but um, I'm not talking about the optogenetics in this talk. Right, so you see it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a effect that is actually much kinder on the animal itself. Um, it, we know it works, because it can generate a rebound, but I can show you this later. So the question is then, what happens when you sleep deprive the flies for longer enough? And I'm going to show you a result. Um, first, uh, I wanted to um, actually, maybe I can immediately show you the big thing and then go back. So what do we expect in, in the first place? What do we expect to see? We expect to see them dying, actually, based on what has been published. And uh, there is only one experiment that's been published about sleep deprivation, uh, chronic sleep deprivation in Prosophila. It was published by the group, uh, by um, Paul Shaw, actually, uh, when he was still a postdoc. Um, and uh, it was a very important paper. And this is the experiment they've done. Um, uh, it's, as it is described in the paper, individual continence flies were kept awake for 70 hours by tapping on the tubes when they stopped moving. Um, the result was that two out of 12 flies that they tested died after 67, 70 hours. So obviously this is, was 2002, um, so different times. We didn't have this technology. Experiment is very limited in numbers, okay? So it's only 12 flies that we tested. It's not easily reproducible because I will have a hard time finding a student who will be able to sit by a fly 60, 70 Those hours, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> tapping on the tube. Yeah. If I, if I were to do the experiment, I would just look around and kill the flies when the body is working. <laughs> right, so we've done it using the etoscope, and we've done it using, um, in fact, uh, two different data set. Um, um, in this one, which is the one I'm going to show you today, there is another one which I'm not, I cannot show you today because we have, I still have to compile the data. This one, we extended the sleep deprivation time to 10 days. 
okay? So it's 9.5 days, in fact. And again, we sleep deprived male or females. The gray would be the control flies. The control flies are physically sitting next to the flies being sleep deprived, but they are not, the tubes are not rotating. And the sleep deprived flies, the tube rotates after 20 seconds of immobility. And you see that the sleep deprivation works very well. They basically get no sleep throughout these uh, 10 days. And so what do you get at the end? You get no lethality, right? So this does not kill the flies. It does not kill the flies during the 10 days of sleep deprivation. Then what we've done is we took the flowers out of the machine, we put them in tubes, we look at longevity, and it does not kill the flies after. There is no difference between control and sleep deprived flies. So it does not affect lethality, uh, neither during nor after the sleep deprivation. The experiment that I like, I'd like to show you is the one we're still compiling, is the one where we're running this, not for 10 days, but for six weeks. And the result is the same, they don't die. Okay, so that's very striking. Um, uh, together with the first part of the talk, where I showed you that sleepless flies exist, it really suggests that either flies, or maybe other animals, don't need sleep as a vital necessity. Um, or it might also suggest that they get enough sleep in adults, for instance, 20 seconds of immobility to survive. In either case, it's a you know, very uh, important finding. Uh, it's not easy to be, again, in this position because I don't know exactly which one of these two hypotheses is the right one, but I feel it's, 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 you know, we should be open to all interpretations. So one interpretation, as I say, is that actually sleep situation is not uh, lethal, eventually lethal. Uh, if you look at the, the existing literature, it might well be the case. As I mentioned to you, the data we have are from dogs, but you cannot trust them really. Rats, equally stressful. Um, flies experiment, now the result is different. We have experiment, uh, sleep deprivation experiment in pigeons, due, using actually the same discovered water system, and pigeons also don't die after many days of sleep deprivation. Uh, we don't have any experiment from humans. You cannot possibly do this experiment in humans, right? Um, some people claim that there is a disease uh, which is called um, fatal familial insomnia uh, that might be a disease that shows how sleep is a vital necessity. The reason is that this is a, actually a prion disease. Uh, it eats up your brain, destroys a lot of your brain to the point where it destroys the part of your brain that controls sleep and wakefulness, and these people cannot fall asleep anymore. And so they stay uh, completely awake for some of them for months, and then eventually they die. I don't think that's a very good control experiment because you're basically chewing the people's brain. And so how can you know that you know, they die out of sleep deprivation and not by the fact that the half of the brain is gone? So one take home message is that you know, we should be open to, um, to new possibility, to new hypotheses, and one of them being sleep is not a vital necessity. And then you might argue, but then it is not a vital necessity, why is evolutionary conserved? And um, um, it is evolutionary conserved uh, yes, circadian rhythms are evolutionarily conserved, right? Uh, even plants have circadian rhythm. I don't think there is a single animal on this planet that doesn't have a, a way of you know, showing circadian rhythm, or a single, probably, organism. Even yeast have some kind of circadian rhythm. But it doesn't mean that it's vital necessity. You can have circadian mutants, and they live. They are not happy, but they live. So another behavior which I uh, introduced before is feeding. On the other hand, feeding is universally conserved and is a vital necessity. So the question becomes, is sleep more like circadian rhythms or more like feeding? Um, and the idea with the hypothesis that sleep is more like feeding, what we try to uh, propose here is uh, what we call a, a tripartite model of sleep. So if sleep is like feeding, then you can imagine, as in feeding, that not all components of sleep do the same job. So Think about eating. We know that about uh, you know human average human adult needs about 2,000 calories uh, to survive. That's just the normal intake of calories that you need in order for your body in order to work. If you go below that for long enough, then you'll eventually die. And then there is an amount of calories that is not vital requirement, but is uh, is useful. Uh, so if you're running uh, or if you're exercising or you're studying, extra calories can help you do a better job. And then there is a third component which is uh, neither vital nor useful. It's, in fact, quite detrimental, and that's the one that allows you to gain weight. And get, getting rid of either three components is something that your body does not want you to do, okay? I don't know if you've ever been in position of uh, going into a diet, 
I had when I was came back from the United States. I obviously, as the th stereotype commands, I was a bit overweight, so I decided I you know just uh, do a little diet. And it was difficult. It was not easy to just give up the extra beer or the extra croissant or the extra thing. My body kept saying to me, "Look, you do need those calories, right? You're hungry. You you you, you should eat that extra croissant." It's just a lie, <laughs> okay? And so it's possible that the same happens with sleep. It's possible that this sleep has three components: one that is uh, really vital and indispensable, and uh, you cannot really get rid of. One is actually only useful, for instance, if you're studying or if you're performing. And one is absolutely not necessary. Uh, it's easy to grasp this if you look at how sleep is present along, along the animal kingdom. So for instance, elephants, giraffes, um, sleep as little as two, three hours a day. Brown bats, small brown bats in the cave, they sleep 20, 21 hours a day. So the question is, does a bat really need 20 hours of sleep? Probably not. Probably what evolution has done has found a way to keep these little animals sleep most of the day so that they can be awake only when the insects are around and feed and mate or whatever, and the rest of the time they're out of trouble. So if it's easy to accept that this works for bats, that there is a huge component of sleep that they get just to be out of trouble, maybe we should accept this the same as for us, for flies or for humans. So that's one thing that I think we're, we're proposing with this, uh, with this experiment. I close it here. Uh, if there are questions, um, we might have to go back to some slides. I uh, just want to uh, acknowledge the lab. Um, um, you met Anna. She's uh, here in the audience. The, the work I presented today is the work of Quentin, uh, who built the etoscope together with Louis, who's not in this picture, um, and Esteban. Um, together, they've been running um, all of the um, behavioral experiments. That's it. If there is any question, I'll be happy to answer it. Now.